Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to wait just about 20, 30 seconds so everybody can come into the webinar. Again, welcome and good afternoon. We're just waiting for folks to flow into the, the webinar. We'll give folks another 15, 20 seconds. Sometimes it takes a little bit. Um, but thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to the discussion. All right, um, it's one minute past, we'll go ahead and get started. First off, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Quentin Soufran, I'm Senior Advisor with Excel and Ed, um, with a focus on innovation policy. Hi, I'm Adriana Harrington and I am the Director of Innovation here at Excel and Ed. Um, and we look forward to sharing uh, with you today what is a, a new resource and set of, of tools uh, that uh, we have been working over the past six to seven months on. Uh, it's called Pathways Matter. And um, it really seeks to kind of, uh, I think, start a conversation around an area that I think we all agree is both um, extremely top of mind, uh, given uh, not just where states are in their efforts to improve education to workforce pathways, but also given where we are in terms of um, the pandemic in the past year, and the challenges that have brought, uh, they have brought. Um, we're gonna spend our time today looking at a, a few different things. One is um, we'll, we'll give you some background and context as to kind of why we launched into this project um, and, and uh, what we hope to, to accomplish with it. The second is um, we'll walk through the online tool and resources available, really with an eye of uh, the different types of users and, and the, the information that's available uh, depending on your role, whether you're a policymaker, state partner, supporter, advocate, funder. Um, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about how we, we think this can be useful and how we hope to use it as a, a jumping off point to work with states, partners, uh, and others who are, are deeply invested in developing high quality pathways for learners. Um, finally, we'll end with kind of where we go from here. And um, part of that will be, um, we, we wanna hear your feedback in terms of what you've seen and, and what you feel like is most useful, but also um, where you feel like um, you would like to see this work be, uh, become more um, uh, useful to you. Um, just a note, uh, the chat is open. So we, uh, it's gonna be a, a fairly large uh, group or at least based on registration. So uh, while uh, we can't interact um, on Q&A uh, over voice, we, we urge you and encourage you to put your comments, questions in the chat. We'll stop at different points throughout the, um, the presentation to, to tackle those and monitor them. So um, please welcome and, and share your thoughts as we go through. So I'll, I'll kick it off first with a, a note about, before we get into kind of what, what constitutes the full suite of resources and tools that we've developed, just a little bit of context from the standpoint of Excel and Ed. I mean, we obviously work with states and partners across the nation, and, and this is an area in terms of pathways that over the past several years, we've really sought to expand um, you know, our, our, um, our, our resources and our support for policymakers and system leaders. And um, part of that work has came with a few realizations, I think, for us internally as a, as a team. Um, and also kind of looking out at the work that was going on in states. And the first piece of that is 
obviously, um, you know, people of all ages are, are really finding themselves unprepared and there's a wealth of data that we don't need to walk through to show that. And I think that um, what we've learned is, you know, one, that this is no longer just a, an issue of K-12 systems. Um, and so when we were working in states, we were very focused historically on, on this particular uh, matter um, on the K-12 sector, but realizing very quickly that pathways span to and through um, post-secondary and on into the workforce. And, you know, as many states have, have noted, um, you know, creating on and off ramps for learners uh, to come back into systems um, and, and upskill and advance their career are also critical. I think the other thing that we've learned is that policymakers in states tend to focus on one or two particular um, you know, solutions in a, in a legislative term. And so a lot of one year, it might be that apprenticeships are the coin of the realm. In others, uh, it might be something around college acceleration, or they're looking at um, some, some other, um, you know, um, pathway or data navigation uh, solutions. And, and what we found, and, and we have been, we, by the way, we are supportive of all these things, um, but what we found is that oftentimes when they're tackled in isolation or, or not really looked at in the context of a state's full kind of ecosystem of policies, that they don't end up having the impact that many hope that they might. Um, and some of that obviously can be an implementation issue. But um, I think what we've found is that it's also kind of the lack of a common framework for understanding what are the policies, programs, and supports that need to be in place from post-secondary to and through post, um, I mean, from K-12 to and through post-secondary and into the workforce. And how do we make sure that we are not just focusing on one system of learners um, as, we, as we think through that? So Pathways Matter is uh, at least our, our attempt to put a stake in the ground about what is a comprehensive framework for, or as we like to term it, a continuum of policies that really stretch across systems, across levels that can help states really understand, A, where they are in terms of their progress on their own journeys to create these pathways, and two, where are their opportunities to strengthen, fill gaps, or even just take advantage of uh, other supports that might already be in place. Um, so just one thing that I would note is that we did start with some core principles for this work. Um, one is we started with the learners, um, and we know that learners take different educational journeys. Um, it might be the student who, who seamlessly transitions from high school onto a post-secondary program and to a degree and out into the workforce. That is obviously something Excel and Ed has been laser focused on uh, throughout the, the, the course of its, um, its work over the years to make sure that all those policies and supports are there. But there's a growing recognition that more and more learners are all also taking different routes. Some are, are using stackable opportunities or credentialing uh, programs to kind of build their skills as they go along because they also need to be engaged in the workforce. Um, and still others are, uh, especially that we're seeing in the pandemic now or the coming out of this, are, are workers that are having to rethink you know, what their occupations are, uh, whether it's due to automation, whether it's due to the pandemic or, or both, frankly. We're seeing job markets and um, workplaces change drastically. So learners um, that are at the adult level who need to come back into these systems need the same supports and policies to help them uh, achieve their, their goals. The second is um, these policies don't work in isolation and neither do the stakeholders that support uh, pathways. It's no longer just a question of the um, the state's education agency, it's the post-secondary system, it is uh, local and regional intermediaries, it is the workforce, it is business and industry, and it is communities that all play a part in supporting learners and making sure that the opportunities not only are available, but they are of the quality and alignment that you would expect that are gonna lead to high wage, high demand, and, and high skill occupations. And that finally, just as, as uh, stakeholders have to work together, policies have to do so too, and that they are more powerful when they are architected and looked at um, together in an integrated fashion than they are when tackling um, just one policy here and there. And so in order to kind of create this framework, um, we will admit first off that we are not smart enough alone to do this. So we engaged a really smart group of people in our advisory council um, and who helped us really think across systems, across the sets of learners, and then thinking about how um, this might be applied to states as we 
uh, go forward. And so what we're going to show you is, is at least our phase one um, result of this work, um, which is Pathways Matter. And it's an online tool that uh, hopefully starts uh, just as our principals does with the, with the learners. And then um, it shows the different types of journeys, but more importantly, how the policies that we put into place, that we support, that we improve, actually have a real impact on the journeys that learners take and can sometimes uh, help them accelerate or fast track their ways to uh, credential and occupational uh, success, or they can really um, be a hindrance to whether it's access, equity, affordability, all of these issues that we hear about um, time and time again, policies play a key role as do the stakeholders. Um, the second is uh, the tool includes a policy continuum, which Adriana will show you with these are the six focus areas and 20 policies that we've identified at least as, as being um, critical uh, to a, an education to work for system that is supporting learners across systems and across levels. Uh, obviously, anytime you put a stake in the ground about the number of policies, which ones and so forth, there's a lot of questions around what about and we welcome those. Um, this is kind of our first foray into thinking about a manageable, even if it is a large number of policies that states can tackle to understand kind of their landscape and how to improve it. And then finally, um, the, the tool also includes state case studies. Um, you know, having a tool, having these resources is great, but we did want to show how it can be applied to a state context. And so we took the framework and um, we then um, laid that against uh, what's going on currently in the progress that 10 states are making. Um, so each case study identifies the policies that are in place, uh, any gaps. Um, we have some additional states that will be uh, added to the list here that you can see, um, including a, a, a standalone report in Florida, which will be coming out in June, which we're excited about, which will go into a little bit more depth around recommendations and the opportunities there. Um, why we chose these 10 states, I would just say, uh, first, they represent uh, kind of a diversity of geography and approaches. Um, uh, you know, no, none of these two states are, are, are I, I would say, set up in the same way and how they are approaching or, or governed in that way uh, across systems. And then on top of that, um, we picked states that were at different points in their journeys. Obviously, there's some states that are, are just real uh, leading examples of the progress there. And the other states, it's not to say they're not. We're saying that these are states that we feel like there is a, a um, huge opportunity um, and they're, they're kind of poised to make progress going forward. So with that, I will stop uh, and turn it over to Adriana, who will share the Pathways Matter tool with you. Great, thank you so much. So as Quentin mentioned, the tool is organized in the three buckets of showcasing how policies um, impact individual learner journeys, the 20 policy areas and the state case studies. Front and center, we wanted to put the, the right that folks are finding themselves unprepared for the reality of today's um, evolving job market. This is not new. This is something that um, we have been working on for a long time that folks on the call um, kind of are trying to think and grapple with. And what I um, love about this resource is it gives an additional tool in folks' toolbox when they're thinking about policies and how to actually address um, this challenge. We place the stakeholders here front and center on the first page. Because as Quentin mentioned, we know this is not K-12 alone, this is not post-secondary alone, that employers have an important role to play in being actively engaged and, and really clearly communicating what their needs and how to help um, to um, the labor market information and their kind of current and future demands. Intermediaries, huge value add in, in being entity that can transition us from employers to K-12, because we know that we sometimes speak different languages. So being that connector point, policymakers and government agencies are the kind of target audience for this tool, given that it is policy focused. How are we looking at the whole continuum to develop and adopt policies? How are we thinking about where we are aligning and pushing our quality and where those big gaps are for learners? And then people are communities, right? The folks on the ground also have 
a big play in supporting um, the work. First big piece of the site is centering it on learner journeys. Um, so this is a good entry level piece for grounding us in why we do this work. So there are three uh, learner journeys that we chose to on the site. We know every learner um, is unique, but we wanted to showcase how that continuum or spider web of policies impacts us um, as I think Adriana's frozen up here for a second. Um, as you can see, um, the, the site itself is oriented around the learner journeys that we um, anticipated. And um, I'm gonna actually share, I'll see if I can, she comes back on in just a second. But this is the part of the area where we really wanna show how the um, policies are linked to learners. Hey, there you are. My back, I'm so sorry. Okay, I must have frozen. Okay, I, I'm just gonna. Um, but uh, Alex is a learner who um, is able to access college acceleration options in an early college and get a year's worth of credit to then go directly into a two-year college where she then wants to use the transfer policy to go on to a four-year. Um, this is something where policy is a big player in making sure that the schools across the state have those college accelerations options, um, that there's funding to support for them, that uh, there's statewide ability where she could transfer those credits and then not lose credits when she's transferring to a four-year school, and then leveraging a regional intermediary um, to get that connection with a local engineering firm to get that work-based learning. Um, and having a statewide system for both K-12 and post-secondary is a strong policy um, to support Alex's learner journey. The next um, learner that I want to talk through is Jordan. So Jordan um, is an individual who is able access an IT program of study in her high school um, to obtain a industry credential of the Network Plus certification. So here states are um, having to think about high quality CTE programs and how they work in K-12 and post-secondary. Um, and then thinking about how are we creating the credentials so that they have value in the labor market and how are they stacking um, in order to make sure that there's and in what a learner can achieve. Then um, the learner is able to access a registered apprenticeship and through industry engagement incentives, um, gaining access to a mentor and additional supports before um, Jordan earns another credential to kind of advance her career. Um, here, it's a great example of where there's on and off ramps. Jordan could have chosen to take that first credential, go straight into the workforce, or do a registered apprenticeship with a post-secondary option. Um, so really seeing that kind of spider web of um, policies and how they're supporting individual learners. And then the last one is Taylor, um, who after 10 years at the same company is um, eliminated due to automation. This very really could be a, um, a due to a pandemic related downsizing where um, Taylor is having to, to, after years in the workforce, rethink where they want to go in their own um, pathway and career path. So they're leveraging a skills retraining and program um, where the clearly laid out here are the five in demand, high need, high wage, high skill um, fields that folks can consider. And then Taylor can take advantage of having a last dollar um, financial aid program where they started their degree before and, and can receive state funding to continue that onwards. 
So we really wanted to ground the work in individuals because that's where the rubber meets the road in seeing how policies um, affect learners on the ground. The next piece that I want to talk through is the, the actual policies. Um, so we have grouped them in six main focus areas, learner post-secondary acceleration, post-secondary credential attainment, workforce readiness, employer engagement, um, and continuing alignment and quality. We grouped them to, to really um, right off the bat show that these policies cannot and should not happen in isolation. But if you're thinking about, about one policy, how are you strengthening the others that support it to, to really amplify the work? So I'm gonna go through at a high level um, the 20 policies. So in the bucket of learner pathways, the first is, do we have high quality CTE programs that align to high skill, high wage, high demand careers for both K-12 and post-secondary? Um, really thinking about the knowledge and the skills that our individual, our learners will need to be successful. And then are there policies in place to target funds towards these high quality programs, both at the, the post-secondary level to start up new programs um, and to sustain programs that might have additional costs that come on as technology, um, for example, change or teacher training, um, needing to, to maintain current with industry requirements. The next big piece is as a state, do you know, do we know where those high quality programs exist and who is able to access um, and obtain them thinking about the industry credentials, the programs of study, college acceleration options. And all of this has power if the agencies are working, have determined to select priorities together um, that they are working on across the work so that K-12, post-secondary, labor, economic and community have agreed upon the priorities in terms of aligning and strengthening the policies that are happening. The next big bucket is um, post-secondary acceleration. And here we can see at the top that for each of the policies, we have indicated learners um, are most impacted by the policies. So for example, college acceleration, has um, power in supporting K through um, folks who are obtaining their bachelor's degree. So we have college acceleration, which is one that um, a lot of states have made really great strides on in things like advanced placement, dual enrollment, um, thinking about credit for prior learning and earned credentials. Are, do we have systems in place where if someone has already earned um, an AP or someone has already entered the workforce, how are we accelerating their path to getting that degree? Are there college articulation agreements in place where if I get um, a five on an AP exam, is that uniformly accepted across state institutions where I might want to go for general credit? And then remediation is a huge one. We know it's a big barrier for learners um, who start at a two or a four year institution or only into remedial courses, we have a big drop off in persistence. So thinking about how we're, we're using code requisite remediation and getting individuals um, right into credit bearing courses to have that momentum that they need. The next big bucket is post-secondary credential attainment. So the policies that really help push and nudge folks across the finish line so reverse transfer is a policy where if you have already earned enough credits between two between where you were at a two-year institution, if you transfer to an institution, just giving individuals um, that associate degree to kind of boost their um, having it under their belt and really helpful for states in, in thinking about tracking and pushing towards post-secondary credential attainment. Folks can then, of course, continue on to the bachelor's. Um, but if they don't, then they have that degree under their belt. Then thinking about how are we funding it, do we have type of um, tuition support for folks 
folks who are close to obtaining their degree um, or individuals for a last mile for a two year school. Outcome based funding, how are we um, incentivizing post-secondary institutions to be nimble um, and maintain that alignment. So pushing beyond outcomes based in terms of just like a graduation to um, long-term wings and then credentials that we um, earlier with our learner uh, Taylor, how are we thinking about what credentials go in order um, to give individuals options so they never hit a barrier to achieve um, in their in their individual pathway. The next big bucket is workforce ready. So here we have the policies of work-based learning, um, which is spans across K-12 and post-secondary registered apprenticeships, um, which is a type of work-based learning, right? A little bit more formal with the Department of Labor or state requirement, an official apprenticeship program thinking about industry credentials and what um, states are promoting or uh, sharing through statewide lists or funding for individuals to earn and then retraining and credentialing. Um, if you need to go back, is there a system to recognize your military training or the work that you have already done? The um, fifth big bucket is employer engagement. Obviously, this one's the whole continuum. So how are we um, thinking about policies to incentivize employers to be at the table? Um, employers of all sizes, we know there are already a lot of engaged employers, um, but thinking about that partnership from employer to K-12 to post-secondary to kind of increase um, employer engagement and signaling. And then legal barriers is an interesting one. Um, especially thinking about individuals who are under the age of 18, get them out um, into the work site. We know that there are some legal challenges that exist for a reason um, and that there are others that we might think about where are their unnecessary barriers or where are their perceived barriers. That as a state, we can do stronger communication on the allowability of getting folks out into the work site. And then the last big bucket, um, which is at the bottom, but in some ways it's my favorite and everything should be pink because it spans across the whole continuum is that um, alignment and quality indicators. So as states across different agency, can we define what we mean by quality? And do we, are, are we using the same term in the same way? And then do we have the to know we are what we are doing and, and where we are going with it. For each of these individual policies, we have provided a definition, which we are hopeful is, is helpful in that piece of are we using in way, being able to clearly articulate what we mean, why we included, we know we only included um, but making sure we clearly verbalize the power of the policy. And then successful states have, is are not at quality. So if you are um, a policymaker or someone, a system leader at a government agency, and you're thinking about pushing a policy further, what does quality look like in states? And, and how can we take the work that's already happening and can continue to leverage it going forward? Here at the bottom, we have related policies. So they're already grouped in the focus. But um, if you are thinking about a state longitudinal data system, what other policies should you also, or could you also be thinking about at the same time to strengthen the work to make that spider web um, a continuum? So data is important for having an audit, right, in order to figure out what is out there, who is accessing um, programs or credentials, cross-agency shared priorities and measuring your progress against them, and outcomes-based funding. You have to know what the outcomes are in order to have a robust um, outcomes-based funding process. If you click on see state examples, um, there are three to four states that are kind of promising in this specific policy area. So for example, here is Kentucky 
and their KY stats model for their state longitudinal data system. We know that every state is in a different place and has individual priorities, but we're hoping that this is a strong resource for individuals to get ideas or, or think about which states to, to talk to to collaborate. Um, in this continuous improvement, we have included an opportunity to strengthen even on these promising state exams, um, just because we want everyone to be, be thinking about how to push policies uh, further and forward. The last piece of the puzzle, and as Quentin um, mentioned, there's kind of different tiers of users. This is where it's um, very um, into the policy analysis. So for the 10 states, we mapped what is already in place in policy in statute or in program for um, the, these 10 states. So on the website itself, we have listed two policies that are a strength for the state. So for here, for example, in North Carolina, their targeted CTE program funding is a strength for the state and then one opportunity. Um, all of these uh, case studies have been reviewed by individuals in the state. Huge thank you to my future NC um, and all of their partners at the government agencies that gave feedback to this. Um, we wanted this to feel helpful um, and so really appreciate the partnership across all of the state for folks who gave um, feedback on them. And then the, if you really love policy, um, the case study is, is the area to dig into where we get super nitty gritty about what's happening. So we have this high level snapshot of what's happening in North Carolina with three strengths and three opportunities listed. And then as you can see for each of the 20 policies, we've done a quick state analysis of what's already in practice giving an opportunity to strengthen, and then some examples from other states. So if you are a state looking at this and think, well, this flags an area of growth for us, where could I think about how to strengthen it? There's some jumping off points for conversation pieces here. Um, so we are hoping that this can be a tool and an asset, not only just for the 10 states that we did the case study for, if, you're, if you are not a, a state that we did a case study for, let us know if you, if you would be interested in partnering. Um, but this is the kind of really gritty, how do we use this continuum to take a step back, see where we are and where are those opportunities and where can we be leveraging and prioritizing going forward. So I just said, a lot of things. Feel free to type into the chat if this resonates. Questions, let's see your state. You'd love um, for us to consider it, but give us your reactions. We'd love to hear them. Great, thanks, Adriana. Um, so please, again, feel free to share your thoughts in the chat. Um, or feel free to follow up with us after this uh, webinar if you're looking for specific information about a state that um, you are working in or represent. Um, we're also happy to, uh, if you don't see your state in, in there, as, as Adriana noted, um, always happy to engage. We did a lot of research across the nation for the state examples of all the policies. So uh, it was a huge learning experience for us, but hopefully um, we can use that to, to help you make connections or find those policies or solutions that, that you might be looking for uh, in your state. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're excited about the tool. We hope it's a helpful resource for folks. Um, we also recognize that it is in and of itself just a tool. Um, and so I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit to, to like, how, how is this useful or how do we want to use it, you know, with folks? And by that, I don't mean just Excel and Edge, but with partners, with others, to really think through um, how we can support the range of stakeholders who are playing that role. Because uh, whether it, regardless of whether it is a policymaker or in the legislature or um, a governor's office or at the system leader, um, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into to these policies because they end up uh, indefinitely or 
typically being programs and implementation is key. And that's where you also uh, bring in intermediaries, communities, et cetera. So we recognize even if folks don't feel it, the policies uh, have, have an impact to, to, to really change lives. And in some cases for the good, in some cases um, to keep them from, from reaching uh, their full potential. Um, so in thinking through what we're seeking to do, I, I think uh, first is, is really leverage this framework, the six focus areas, the 20 policies as a means to communicate. Um, we've been in a lot of discussions where folks are talking about key aspects of pathways. They might actually be talking about pathways in general. And we found that um, if you stop, and because or we have we've had to stop at times and make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and whether it's what it is, uh, that's important. But I think the other thing that we have found is, you know, when we talk about what what constitutes high quality and effectiveness, that's a conversation that um, is still yet to be had in a lot of states. And by that, I don't mean people aren't talking about it, but they're not necessarily connecting those. Uh, conversations across systems and across levels. Um, secondly, obviously, we want to help connect folks uh, to uh, additional examples of policies or those solutions that might be uh, useful to them. I think the other pieces, whether it's through a case study, whether it's through a deeper um, kind of dive report, or whether it's just through technical assistance and kind of discussions, you know, we hope that this framework can also be a, a tool for evaluating kind of the current status of where states are. Um, that's another key component. We know that, you know, majority, vast majority of states have set attainment goals or they have, um, you know, specific initiatives uh, that are targeted uh, at, you know, improving pathways. Um, what we are finding in, in our in our research across states is there's not been a, a, a kind of key cross uh, system or cross level analysis of understanding kind of where, what is the state of play right now? So this is, a, I think, a critical opportunity that we hope folks will take advantage of and obviously reach out to us in any ways we can support to understand that. And finally, just the prioritization. You know, what to tackle But is, is one question, but a question that we also get around these policies is what, what can we tackle in the context of uh, you know, budget restrictions? What can, we, what can we tackle in the context of one-time spending, which there's a ton of money floating through states and that will continue to be, um, you know, uh, pushed out over the, the coming uh, weeks and months. But how can states leverage the different funding elements to prioritize not just specific learners, but the policies? And then finally, uh, you know, we hope, and it's been a huge learning process for us, but a big piece of, of our work, whether it's Pathways or any other policies, is making connections. Um, and helping folks learn together, um, because there are some states that are doing amazing things right now um, in terms of, of developing programs that are, are not just focused on one element, but often cross policies. And so um, learning from others, really kind of exploiting and figuring out how can we customize a, a solution or policy um, for, for a specific state purpose. Um, so I, this issue of a common framework, the cross-sector coordination, the examples, um, our primary users and, and, and outreach for audiences are policymakers, system leaders, government agencies, governors and executive leadership. At the same time, we know that um, regional intermediaries, um, program providers, whether they are focused or have a policy agenda, they are often impacted or um, they're certainly the learners they serve are impacted by uh, either you know policies that are they're helping or or gaps in policies, and finally um, philanthropy and funders. I mean, we realize that prioritization and common definitions are critical, and so we hope that these are useful um, in in those uh, ways as well. So, a couple of examples. If if you, if you know, we think about legislators and policymakers, um, a few use cases that we we've kind of just teased out to help folks understand how we hope uh, this can be used is. In this case, Senator Smith is interested in the skills retraining opportunities to, to address um, some the economic and, and learner challenges from the pandemic. Um, the tool, and, and, and certainly um, we can point you to, you know, the language that defines what skills retraining are, you know, across states, the examples of states that, are have, that have strong policies. This is a huge kind of focus right now, particularly with a lot of the stimulus slash release funds relief funds. And um, there are some states that are really doing creative things around skills retraining. And it focuses on a set of learners that I think um, is often traditionally underserved by some of the systems that have been in play. Um, and then obviously two or three other policies, you know, 
focusing on skills retraining and short-term credentials um, are great, but without having uh, a policy around what constitutes a credential of value or what, um, what is a stackable credential. Uh, we hear a lot about them and states have, some states have identified them, but in a lot of states, it still is a, t a talking point. And then how do you bring industry and, and business into the mix? Um, this is something we heard a lot from our advisory council. Um, how are states doing that? Because it's one thing to have a program on the books, but at the end of the day, this is about uh, workplaces, this is about occupations, this is about businesses hiring, retaining, and continuing to help uh, folks advance. Similarly, system leaders, government agencies, um, while not policy makers, in some cases they are, um, but they don't pass legislation, but the key here is implementation. And we've heard loud and clear that again, policies are one thing, the implementation of policies are another. And so where are they working? And in this case, it's a program director at an SEA that's interested in expanding statewide articulation agreements. Well, what are the common languages uh, and the common, I mean, the common definitions to leverage in these conversations? Um, what suggestions might there be for ensuring a quality process? And um, where are two to three states um, that um, would, would serve as connecting or jumping off points to dig deeper on kind of their, their journey um, in terms of not just having a policy in place, but how do they roll it out? How do they implement it? And what are the lessons learned uh, from, from that experience? And finally, one of the key constituents that we found that in states that are really moving the needle in pathways um, is the strong role of governors and executive leadership. Um, often governors can set the agenda. And in this case, you have a governor March, uh, who's considering a sub cabinet um, to focus on ed to workforce initiatives. Uh, these are becoming more common across states and thinking through kind of like what are the, the structures that are, are in place to, to really drive forward cross agency collaboration. And often that agenda is set by a governor. Um, so the tool we hope, you know, can point to those shared definitions of success, um, the, the greatest strengths and opportunities available and um, you know, how other states have brought together, uh, whether it be through governors, whether it be through kind of an agency led um, uh, piece, but fundamentally how are and who is at the table and how are they actually moving that forward? Finally, um, a, uh, just something to note here is, is we started this um, discussion with the kind of thought that this we hope is the beginning of a, of a longer conversation. Um, after all, Excel and Ed, I mean, our work is with partners, with policymakers, with governor's offices, with system leaders. And our goal is to continue that engagement um, with this work. Um, so we, we have identified a kind of slate of future activities that we would love to um, pursue. Uh, and one is just, you know, um, continued messaging and understanding of what this framework includes the 20 policies, the six focus areas, and frank conversations about, you know, are these the right policies for all states? Um, do we need to think about customizing for specific states who have uh, specific populations or needs that they're focusing on? Um, one thing that we um, have in, in, in some case, but want to build out further are model policies. Um, so there is a policy that you could say is, is somewhat connected to to any of these uh, six focus areas or a set of them. And, and we wanna make those um, policy resources available to, policy, to, to states as needed. Um, the third piece is really state analyses. If you didn't see a state that you're interested in up there, we, we are more than interested in pursuing additional state analyses. And also uh, we realize that, you know, the resources we have in some cases go pretty deep. So part of our work will be to kind of leverage the site, some of the interactivity to bring those to life as well. Um, and one thing I would flag is we are talking to a, a small group of states that um, are currently interested and we're, we're still looking for additional states um, who might be interested in leveraging this framework as to create kind of a um, their own set of, of kind of landscape analysis and really what is a two, three, four year roadmap for improving pathways for all learners in their states. Um, so these are, these are all top of mind. And then I think the last thing I would, I would just note is that in doing this research, there was a lot of, uh, of, of learning around 
exactly um, what does uh, what are some of the, the the topics that span not just one focus area or one policy, but what are some of the the, the pieces that we saw kind of cutting across systems, cutting across levels, um, and you know obviously the cross system collaboration. Um, lots of conversations with folks about siloing or how do I engage or how do we how do we even kind of value the same uh, metrics so that we're working towards the same outcomes. Um, equity oriented policies and making sure that um, you know we're identifying those policies and the kinds of solutions. Making sure that that states are not leaving certain students behind or that access. Um, and affordability are not, um, you know, key obstacles to, to opportunities. Uh, a big piece, and you won't see it in our um, 20 policies, is pathway navigation and advising. This cuts across. There was not a focus area. And frankly, we haven't seen um, a great state policy. There are lots of great programs, but it's a, it's a huge challenge for states in tackling, both from a standpoint of how they staff and fund counseling across uh, systems and what that's for, and also just in, in, in making the information uh, available and making sure that families have that information to, to advocate and empower uh, their own decisions. And finally, funding. Um, there's gonna be a lot of talk about funding as, as these, um, you know, there's one-time funds come out, but the, the, the reality here is how can systems leverage their existing state um, and federal and local dollars to really fund for the outcomes that they want. So, all of these cut across the pieces and we are looking at creating additional resources here. I think at this point, um, one thing we would love to do is, is get a little bit of input from you, if you're willing, as to what interests you um, in terms of additional work here and what might be most helpful given the, the work that you perform, that you uh, do and the state's use support. Great. Just um, launched a poll that kind of gives some opportunities on what might be most helpful um, for you as an individual. So be it um, more case studies, um, please feel free to add into the chat what states you would like to see. Um, if additional guidance, right, the case studies right now are pretty heavy, um, thinking about how to narrow down the implementation um, recommendations, those cross-sector resources that Quentin just talked about, um, additional functionality in the tool. So if you wanted to be able to click three policies and download those to be able to take to a meeting, to a briefing, convening on policy areas or ongoing um, technical assistance for us. So I'm seeing folks uh, weigh in on the chat, which is amazing. I will share the results um, in just a minute, giving folks a second to respond. And if you're um, flagging more case studies, do please put in the chat what, what state you'd like to see. Okay, about 75% have received, which is great. Okay, I will share the results. Can you see them? No. <laughs> there we go. Can you see them now? <laughs> Yes. Okay, so it looks like folks um, want to see a few more states, but the big area um, is those cross-sector resources, which is which is good to hear. Great. I will. Um, I will just uh, just say um, before we close today. Um, one, thank you for, for attending and joining us, but I would say that we wanted to acknowledge um, the, the hard work and, and just great contributions of our advisory council members, which you can see here, the organizations they represented. 
And also um, just make sure that folks know that this work could not have been possible without the, the gracious support of the Gates Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropy. So thank you for that. Um, the last thing I, I would say, if there, if there are no other pieces in uh, coming through is that um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're more than happy to kind of um, share more one-on-one um, -on -one or in small groups as, as folks are interested, but um, we hope that uh, we can continue this conversation with you going forward. And thank you so much for your attendance this afternoon.